Uh, my name is Jonathan Jones. I'm the program director at the University of Mississippi Medical Center in Jackson. Uh, and we're going to talk about writing proper test questions. Uh, you can see our objectives. It's pretty simple. We're basically going to just make sure we understand the right terminology and then learn a couple techniques uh, that are used to write standardized test questions. Uh, generally, the same techniques used uh, by ABEM specifically, uh, USMLE, or really any medical or non-medical uh, multiple choice test. Question writing terms, uh, I think everybody can read this. Uh, the quick thing to know is there's a lot of confusion about the word question uh, or item. Um, so we'll try to be more specific and use the word stem, which is basically uh, what most of us refer to as the question. Uh, it's that part that uh, begins that you read. You know, patient, 42-year-old male, presents with blah, 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 blah. What is the most likely diagnosis? That's the stem. Options are obviously all the different options. The answer, uh, often referred to as the key, is the correct answer. And then all of the incorrect answers are foils uh, or distractors. Both those are used to refer to the uh, options which are not the correct answers. So before you write a test question, uh, you really need to know the purpose of the question. Why are you asking this question? What are you trying to test specifically? Uh, and remember, just like when we were all you know, pimped in med school or, or as an intern, uh, we don't want to be asking questions that are that read my mind type of thing. You know, what is the test writer thinking? Uh, we need to ask questions that pertain to emergency medicine uh, and specifically that a good practitioner of emergency medicine would know the answer to uh, and a poor practitioner of emergency medicine would not know the answer to. Uh, and preferably or uh, almost required, these questions should impact patient care. Uh, and if you don't know the answer, then that would negatively impact patient care. Uh, also remember that we're writing test questions. Uh, if we want to be similar to ABEM, we're trying to set a standard of the competent emergency physician, not the expert emergency physician. So uh, we all know that uh, there's things in emergency medicine that we don't know. Uh, we wished we did, but we don't. Uh, and remember, again, we're not writing test questions to try to find those top 5% of smartest emergency medicine physicians out there. Uh, it's really trying to get that base of knowledge that if you don't possess it, uh, you're really just going to be providing bad care. So make sure you know what you're asking and, and why. Uh, two levels of questions. Uh, level one are basically simple questions. They ask facts. Uh, they ask, uh, how do you do something? What's the most uh, common uh, cause of, of a certain disease? Uh, what's the best treatment for a certain disease? These are fine questions and they're important questions. The stem should literally be, you know, five words long. Uh, and, and ABEM does ask these questions on their test, as I think we've, we've seen. So um, don't, don't eliminate simple questions, uh, but know that uh, we definitely need some, some more complex questions as well. I'll have examples in a couple slides. Level two questions are complex. Uh, they test problem solving. Uh, they don't ask a fact. They ask the, uh, the examinee to use the facts that they know to answer a novel scenario basically to answer, hey, a patient comes to you with these somewhat vague sim symptoms or less than textbook symptoms, what would you do? There is some judgment that goes into this, and I know with tests sometimes we think there is no judgment, it's just right or wrong, but uh, our, our profession is all about making uh, judgments uh, for the best treatments. Um, so uh, level two questions, complex. Um, ABEM makes it clear uh, as do most other USMLE and other writing uh, tests that uh, most of their questions, they prefer to be level two questions. So as we're writing these, we need to remember that most of our questions should be level two and complex. And again, let's look at some examples. Here's an example of a level one uh, test question. What is the most common cause of community-acquired pneumonia in adults? Again, it, it's testing a simple fact. Uh, it's something that should have been learned in med school or residency. Uh, there's a right answer. There's clear wrong answers. It's basically something that if you memorized it once, you'll get it right for the rest of your life. However, it is important to emergency medicine because if you don't know the answer to this, then you're not going to know proper uh, pharmaceutical treatment. So, so this, this would be an acceptable test question uh, for a uh, ABEM board. Um, it's an acceptable level one test question. Uh, and as we know, the answer is uh, E, streptococcus pneumonia. A level two question would be along the lines of this one. 
a middle-aged male presents to the ED without a pulse. His EKG is shown. You also notice that he has a dialysis fistula in his right arm. He received epinephrine and atropine one minute ago. What medication should be given next? So again, this isn't a fact. Uh, you have to think about it. Uh, uh, you have to interpret the EKG. You have to look at that EKG and say, you know, what rhythm is that? Uh, you have to take the, the facts that are given to you. Oh, it's a dialysis patient. He has no pulse. Uh, so he's coding. Uh, why do dialysis patients code? Well, I don't know. Let's look at that EKG. Oh, that's a that's a that's a, almost a sine wave, or that's what I would. That's the best sine wave I've ever seen. So it's probably a potassium problem. Um, so we all uh, then have to go back to our repertoire of facts. How do you treat hyperkalemia specifically in a coding patient? Uh, and so for this, the right answer would be B. So this is again. I think this would be a very appropriate uh, ABEM style level two question for emergency medicine. Um, this is something that every emergency practitioner should know because if they don't, uh, they honestly will end up not providing the best care and potentially uh, killing patients. Um, and it, but it's not so out there that you have to be an expert to know it. All right, so uh, we just talked both levels are, are used on the ABM exam. Level one questions are obviously easier to write, uh, often but not always easier to answer. Uh, and then you see the breakdown there. So I said a couple times that most questions should be level two. Um, this is a, an estimate uh, of maybe what ABEM does. All right, so now that we know the terminology of the proper test questions and the difference between level one and level two questions, we're going to move on to how to actually write a test question. Uh, and it's a seven-step process uh, that uh, most experts follow. Uh, and uh, if you follow this, it actually doesn't make the process longer. It makes it a lot uh, shorter um, because you'll end up writing a good test question from the very beginning. So one, determine the specific, uh, I'm sorry, the general topic. Um, so uh, here's an example. You know this, right? There's always going to be a question on Wolf-Parkinson-White. So this is an example of a topic. The topic we want to test is Wolf-Parkinson-White. We haven't determined the question we're going to ask. We just know that we want to ask something about about WPW. So the next step is then determine the specific aspect. Uh, and I think if you try to combine one and two at the same time, you're going to end up, uh, every time I've done it, confusing them and end up writing a bad question. So, so please first get that general topic, real easy, and then ask the specifics part. So for example, uh, in this, what do we want to test? Do we want to test how to diagnose Wolf-Parkinson-White, how to treat Wolf-Parkinson-White, do we want to test if someone knows the uh, uh, signs and symptoms associated with it? All of those are valid questions to ask on WPW, but not valid questions to all ask in one question or in, in one stem. So for example, let's say we want to test the diagnosis of WPW. Um, it's still not specific enough. We want to know more about it. Are we, do we want to test them on the diagnosis based on maybe signs and symptoms and patient presentation, or do we want to know about uh, the diagnosis based on labs, EKG, radiology, whatnot. As we know, EKG is pretty much the only uh, diagnostic test that's, that's truly important, or at least uh, in a timely fashion. So let's say our specific uh, item we want to test is, does this examinee know about the EKG changes that you see in asymptomatic Wolf-Parkinson-White patients? So again, very specific. We're not looking at can they notice the reentrant uh, rhythm when they're tachycardic? We want to know in an asymptomatic patient that may be presented with syncope or whatnot, can the, can the uh, examinee uh, diagnose Wolf-Parkinson-White? So let's write that stem. So which of these do you think would be a good stem for what we just discussed? So hopefully we got uh, E on that. What is an EKG finding in WPW? All of the others are not the best, and we're going to talk about why they're not the best in just a second. So A, how do you diagnose WPW? Again, it's too vague. Uh, it might be based on symptoms. How does WPW present? Again, that's, this is a symptomolo symptomology question, not an EKG question. And we already decided we wanted to test EKG knowledge. Uh, C, most patients with WPW have tachycardia. Uh, well, that's a statement. And amazingly, you see statements like that uh, all the time. So uh, this might be followed by accept in the answer choices. Uh, uh, but again, that would be just a poor form. Uh, what is a delta wave? So while that does test EKG knowledge of WPW, it's too specific and it now gives it away. It basically gives the answer uh, to the applicant that we wanted. So we want short, specific, to the point. 
what is an EKG finding in WPW? All right, so again, simple, short, specific. The stem must be positively worded. This is an ABEM requirement and generally required of all uh, good standardized tests. So for example, you can't ask the following. All of the following are EKG findings in WPW except. Um, you also don't want to ask true or false questions is we're going to have five answer choices uh, for all of our questions. Uh, and then the stem must be a complete sentence and end with a question. Uh, and you see the example here. And again, that's, these are following the guidelines that uh, any good standardized test, including ABEM tests, follow. Uh, so if we want our test questions to follow the ABEM model, which we should, there's no reason they shouldn't, uh, we want to follow these uh, guidelines. All right. Four, write the answer. Don't come up with the wrong answers. Write the correct answer first. So what is the best answer? So the problem is, we're reading this, delta wave pre-excitation pattern, short PR, QRS abnormalities, tachycardia. Well, those are all the right answers, more or less. Uh, but which would be the best answer for this? Uh, let's go over them one at a time. Delta wave, you can see. While correct, it's, it's too easy to remember, right? I think a lot of people know that delta wave is associated with WPW, but does that mean they actually know how to recognize it on an EKG? And it doesn't. So, so if this was the answer choice we gave, I think a fair number of people would get the, answer, the, the question correct and still not know how to actually diagnose WPW. So B, uh, pre-excitation pattern. Again, it's correct, but, but this is, encompasses many, many changes on the EKG. Uh, and, and so uh, it's also tied into that uh, kind of um, core memorization knowledge that, that, that almost every student knows WPW is pre-excitation. They have no clue what it means. They just know those words together. So again, someone could get this question right without really uh, being able to diagnose WPW. Because remember, step one in our process was we want to talk about WPW. Step two, we want to talk about the diagnosis, EKG diagnosis of it. Um, C, short PR interval. This, I think, would be uh, probably the best correct answer choice for this uh, STEM. Uh, the reason, because it's very specific. Uh, we know what a short PR is. Uh, it's not vague. Uh, and, well, most importantly, is it's accurate. D, QRS abnormalities, is just a little too vague. And E, tachycardia, again, too vague. Uh, and uh, in asymptomatic WPW patients, actually, most of them aren't tachycardic. So this is actually wrong. All right, so step four, we write the answer. So when we're writing the answer, we must remember that the answer should be simple, usually just a few words. Uh, if the correct answer is a sentence uh, or two sentences long, you need to rewrite the stem. Uh, the stem needs to be written in a way where the correct answer is just either one word, two words, three words, just very, very short. It uh, needs to be clear, specific, not vague. And then we talked about avoiding those key words like WPW and Delta Wave. Step five, write the FOIL. So this can be a little fun, but also difficult in writing those wrong answer choices. So which of these would be a, a good FOIL for our question that we just wrote about WPW? And we already know the right answer is short PR interval. We'll walk through them one at a time. So A, deep Q waves in the anterior leads. It's very, very specific. And then, uh, the reason I said remember what our correct answer is, which is short PR interval. You want the foils to be similar in uh, uh, sound and complexity and length as the correct answer. So uh, as you can see, it could be a good foil if our correct answer were short PR interval in the lateral leads or short PR interval in the anterior leads. Uh, but since our answer is short PR interval, our FOIL should really be the same. B, evidence of less ventricular hypertrophy or evidence of LVH. Uh, so this goes back to, this is not a specific uh, finding on an EKG, right? A short PR is a very specific finding. It's not a diagnosis. Evidence of LVH is almost a diagnosis. So again, since our correct answer, since our key answer is uh, actual EKG finding, we want our FOILs to also be EKG findings, not EKG diagnoses. So that's why B would not be a good answer choice. C, prolonged PR interval. So this is the exact opposite of our key answer, which means it's not a good FOIL. 
Um, generally, if you see five answer choices and two of them are exact opposites of each other, there's a very high likelihood that one of those is correct. And so someone who's good at taking tests but knows absolutely nothing about WPW would more than likely have a 50% chance of getting this question right just based on guessing. So that's another good point. Do not make a FOIL that is the exact opposite of the key or correct answer. D, prolonged QT interval. In my opinion, this is an excellent FOIL. Uh, first of all, it's wrong, uh, which is very important. Uh, second is it's similar to our, our correct answer in, in what it is, right? It's an actual EKG finding. Uh, it's not an EKG diagnosis. It's not the exact opposite of our key answer. Um, and uh, so I think this is, a, again, a very good uh, FOIL, would be prolonged QT interval. E, right atrial hypertrophy. This is the exact same uh, reason that uh, LVH is not a, uh, a good answer. Honestly, I couldn't think of a fifth example of a bad FOIL, so that's why I threw that in there. All right, so we're writing the FOILs. Again, it can be kind of fun, but, but honestly, I think one of the most difficult parts of question writing. So remember, they should be a similar physical length of the correct answer cover the same information, similar complexity, uh, and then obviously they should be uh, relevant to the topic and not just completely uh, out of left field. Six, take a break. What by this I mean is stop writing this question. If you want to move and write another question, that's fine. If you want to go uh, have a cup of coffee, go to bed, do a clinical shift, don't submit your question at this point. It's amazing how, how often I've gone back and read a question which I thought was truly excellent and then realized I've made all kinds of mistakes, so, so please just take a break. Seven, review the question, put it all together, let's do that. What is an EKG finding in WPW? It's a great, very short stem, uh, it's a sentence, it's a complete sentence. Uh, remember back to, to grammar, you know, we have a subject, a verb, all that good stuff. It ends in a question mark, we want that. Uh, the reason we want that is because ABEM wants that, so we, let's make our questions the same as them. We have five answer choices. Uh, again, it wasn't covered earlier, but all questions must have five answer choices. Why? Again, that's what ABEM does. So why make a test that's not going to mirror ABEM? Let's see. A, deep Q waves. B, flattened ST segments. C, inverted T waves. D, prolonged QT interval. E, shortened PR interval. Sheesh. Uh, I, I'm even confused. I mean, do I know the right answer? I think I do. Uh, but those, those are all very specific EKG findings. Uh, the answer choices, uh, the FOILs, and the key answer sound the same. Um, if you knew uh, about WPW, you should get this question right. If you don't, if all you remember is I, there's delta waves and uh, something else and pre-excitation, well, guess what? That info doesn't help you at all. Uh, so someone that could answer this question should be able to diagnose WPW in the emergency department. Uh, so again, step seven, we're reviewing the question. All stems must be positively worded. Again, so don't say which of the following are true in WPW except. That's not good. All answers must be in alphanumeric order. So if you go back uh, and look, you can see that it was A was deep Q waves. D, B starts with F, C starts with I, D, P, E, S. Um, that's very important. It seems like it's not important. Uh, but otherwise, if you don't do it that way, uh, then more answers will uh, just the way our brain works, you'll choose uh, B, C, and D uh, for more correct answers. If you were to actually pick uh, which letter would be the key answer, um, you're not random at it. So this way it helps keep it random. So make sure they're in alphanumeric order. All answers are of similar length. All answers are mutually exclusive. Um, well, they don't have to be mutually exclusive. You certainly could have a short PR and a prolonged QT. But, but you can't, uh, we, we want to avoid answers that, that both could be correct is what I'm saying. Um, there's only one clear correct answers and uh, they're in the same class uh, as we talked about measurable changes on the EKG. So we're going back to reviewing it. Is it accurate? That's obviously the most important. Is there only one good answer? Is it relevant to EM? We've all sat through lectures that aren't. Uh, is it, and do you have to have EM knowledge to uh, answer it correctly? Just a few last slides uh, to cover a couple examples. Stimuli. They're pictures, EKG tracings, anything uh, other than words, effectively. Um, often questions have nearly nothing to do with the stimuli, and, and that's just really not good, so please avoid that. 
Um, if using a stimulus, basically, it must be used. I'm going to show you an example on the next slide. Um, but a way to know if you're using stimuli appropriately is don't look at the picture of the EKG and try to answer the question. If you can answer it with a very high likelihood of getting it right without the stimulus, then, de then just delete the stimulus. You don't need it. Um, so, for example, a 53-year-old male with diabetes presents with pain in the right toe after a minor injury two weeks ago. What is the most likely diagnosis? And I put this little x-ray up there that is impossible to interpret anything. And I did that for a reason, because you don't really need that. Uh, I, I think we, uh, you know, maybe don't know what the answer is. Um, but, you know, okay, he, he hurt it. He had a minor injury, so it's going to be maybe traumatic related. It has to be related to diabetes. Uh, so uh, I think the answer here uh, would be A, uh, more likely than not, you know, maybe not, but uh, again, the picture doesn't add a lot. The history kind of gives too much of it away, at least based on those answer choices. So this would be an example of a poor stimulus. So here's the summary, five things to always do. Questions must be positively worded, so not which of the following was not. Questions must have only one correct answer choice. Uh, so you, we're not allowed to say, uh, you know, E, all of the above, or you have A, B, and C, and D says A and B, uh, and E is B and C. You can't do, you do anything like that. Must have five answer choices per question. All answers must be in alphabetical or numeric order, and then stimuli must be used appropriately. Rough guidance for amount of stimulus questions we should have is about 10%. Uh, that's generally what maybe the USMLE and ABEM uh, do. So only about 10% of tw questions should have stimuli. Um, that's all I have. I know we kind of rushed through it. Uh, please review the slides on your own when you have a chance. Uh, and please uh, email uh, me with any questions. I'm happy to discuss this further. Thank you.